for coming so much. Welcome to WordCraft. Terry, thank you for coming. Um, one quick thing is uh, what I think sets WordCraft apart from a lot of other events is that we are here to answer your questions and to serve the local writing community. And to that end, I highly encourage questions. Um, please, throughout the event, feel free to raise your hand, natural breaks in the conversation. I'll uh, call on you because I really want to make sure we're talking about the things you guys want to hear about. Um, with the caveat that we are here to focus on world building. So I know we're all very excited to have Terry here. Let's not go too far off on tangents. We'll try and keep it focused a little bit. Um, and yeah, I think we should just dive in. Um, so again, Terry, thank you. We're so excited. Um, my first memory of reading a novel is The Sword of Shannara like the earliest memory of holding a thick book in my hands. And I was so obsessed with your books as a kid that my town librarian would, as soon as they came in, set them aside and bring them to school for me. So this is a very exciting day for me. Um, and just I because- I feel so old. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no I, I was reading in the womb, it wasn't like, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, so to start, before we really get into the world building aspect, um, I like to ask every guest to just tell us a little bit about how and when did you know you were meant to be a writer? And can you tell us just a little bit about that journey from I want to write to your first published book? <clears throat> In 25 words or less. No, you can have 15. Can you hear me all right? No, I don't know that you're using the mic. It has to be up by your mouth. <laughs> My wife. <laughs> uh, well, I know. I tell the story all the time, so uh, I'm very familiar with it. Um, I knew I wanted to be a writer when I was ten years old. Uh, because I wrote a story for my fourth grade classroom, and uh, as part of an assignment, and my teacher said, you know, gave me some kind of great grade, and she said at the top of this, that you should you should be a writer. So I took that as a, a marching notice and thought, well, I'm going to become a writer. And uh, then after that, um, I didn't do much. Obviously, I was in school, but when I was 13, I wrote an essay. I lived in Illinois, and I wrote an essay for my a local uh, historical journal, I think it was a county magazine, and uh, on the death of Lincoln, and because uh, that's what we did in Illinois. Um, and uh, that was published, and I thought, well, now I'm a writer, I've published something, and I've got my name up there, everybody in the county can see it, and um, it only took another 20 years to do anything with all that. So I, I just think that you, if you're really meant to be a writer, you want to do it bad enough, you find a way to make it happen. And mostly it's just trial and error and trial and error and find out all the things you don't want to do first and then you can go well, settle for this. Yeah. yeah, that's hitting very close to home. My first published piece was um, a poem on the back of a, I grew up in an area of upstate New York called the Adirondacks, it's a state park and there was a Young Writers of the Adirondacks poetry book that came out and my poem in fourth grade got on the back cover. And it was just the most exciting thing. But like my strongest memory from that time is that I didn't know what name to use. So I'm published today as Alexandra Oliva. At the time I went by my nickname, Allie. And then an editor suggested a change in the poem that I was too shy to say no to and I regret the change to this day. I think um, that we, you know, we, we're all storytellers, and uh, I, I was telling stories uh, to my mother huh, at an early <laughs> age, and uh, was pretty good at it, uh, I discovered. And um, I always liked the way that you worked with words, and you used words to build things, and uh, which is sort of the topic we're on tonight. Uh, and I think when you have that kind of passion, uh, you have to find an outlet for it. Well, what, what are the outlets? Well, they all involve writing of one form or another. And for me, it was easy enough uh, because I was not a particularly great student, um, and I was not, a, you know, I was all right, but um, all right, I was pretty good. But <laughs> the thing of it was that I was uh, absorbed in the idea of taking words to create stories and to make those stories come alive, and I was also uh, very involved in magic and uh, 
before that was all part of our society and part of what every young kid did, as boys particularly. But um, I was really caught up in that sort of thing. So it was a natural step for me to move over from one thing to the other. And I tried a lot of different things. I wrote a lot of different stuff. Uh, started out writing, you know, I wrote the great white whale story. I did it better than Melville. You know? <laughs> um, and I wrote to Shane again, and uh, my th I can't remember what, but things like that. And then uh, assembled into fantasy strictly by chance and not with a particular attention that this is the thing I've always wanted to write. I just got absorbed in it, and uh, then one thing led to another. I had to. Um... Uh, you have a wonderful book called Sometimes the Magic Works, which right. is like half memoir, half writing advice. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a beautiful section in there about how you didn't set out to write fantasy. You were really interested in adventure stories. Mm -hmm. And then it was just kind of falling into that adventure world that became the place where you could tell these kind of stories. Mm -hmm. And again, that really resonated with me because I had kind of the opposite approach where I just grew up reading nothing but science fiction and fantasy. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, that's what I, I was trying to, I was trying to write your books, essentially. Like my first practice novel, which was never published, was, you know, me essentially trying to write a Terry Brooks novel. And that's not my voice, it didn't work. Um, so it's kind of the opposite where once I kind of broke out of the genre world, I was able to settle into my voice a little bit more. Well, I grew up, uh, I grew up in a time period when uh, people weren't reading fantasy at all. Uh, to speak of. There were a few writers of fantasy, and most of them were old-timers, H.G. Wells, and that sort of thing, uh, the Tarzan books. Uh, but kids my age, especially boys, read science fiction. That was the big thing. This is back in the 60s, 50s. Well, okay. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's the kind of thing I read because that's that's what every everybody I knew was reading, and I was very taken with them. And uh, it, it was only by chance that I handled path and to stumble over into fantasy. And I think what happens with this sort of thing is that you try a lot of different things, and then eventually you settle on something that fits with who you are and how you look at the world and what you're doing. Um, and I don't know how far we want to get into this, but. Uh, for me, uh, when we're talking, I'm going to talk about world building here for just yeah, a minute. We'll, we'll get there. The single, the single biggest factor for me in, in, in world building is pretty simple. There has to be a major idea in the story that connects to what we know about the real world, and even better yet, what we see happening around us. And that's how, that's what points me in the right direction. Now, I don't know how. Uh, not writing non, sticking, staying away from nonfiction. If you go into that sort of thing, you have to push into a genre where it's very, you know, you, you, you have romance, or you have, uh, you have, um, well, you science fiction is part of it, not so much though, but uh, mysteries, um, different things like that. But the thing about fantasy is that there are no boundaries, are there? There are no boundaries. You can write anything you want to, and there's all kinds of fantasy books out there, and they don't all follow a particular kind of format uh, that you can easily scope out. And that's why we have so many writers today who are working in a whole different realm than what I was working in when I was growing up. I was writing epic fantasy, and now that was that was hot through the Tolkien time period, particularly. But now that that's put to bed and Harry Potter's put to bed, what happens next? Well, you look at today's uh, writers and what they're writing, and it's pretty astonishing. Absolutely. Um, so you kind of broached this topic a little bit, but my first question is, when you are setting out on a series or a new book, like where do you start with building a new world? Is it um, kind of the idea of the landscape or a particular character, or conflict, or, uh, yeah, so what is, typically like that just starting nugget for you when you're embarking on a story. Okay, listen closely, because this is going to be very unhelpful. <laughs> I never, That's what for. never start in the same place twice. Mm -hmm. I can't think of a single book where I could say, well, I started there and then the next book was the same thing, it's the same thing. It doesn't work that way. It usually starts with a question, what if this, what if that? But it's the kind of thing where you're asking a question of what you see, what's happening around you in the, world, in the real world, this real world, and you put it into your story and, and try to answer the question in a different atmosphere altogether. 
And this works particularly well when we're talking about issues of race and sex and uh, relationships between young and old, uh, between any, any subject you want to talk about. It works best when you put that story in a different light and get away from all the prejudices that are everywhere. And then you sit down and you say, well, is it? So what am I talking about? Well, when I wrote uh, the whole, um, see, I can't remember my old books now. <laughs> Whatever that, the Heritage of Shannara series. When I wrote that series, it was all about uh, ecology. It was all about what happens when the world goes sick and is being made sick deliberately by various problems that exist in society and so forth. That was really at the heart of that story, even though the story went beyond that with some other things. What was I doing about when I wrote the uh, Flight of the Gerald Shatter and all of that? That was all about somebody's passage. In this case, somebody who is really, really a sad person who had been, who had been corrupted in early years to be something she wasn't meant to be and who had to find her way back from being the worst possible person in the world to being somebody who counted for something. And that story is a million years old. I mean, we've seen that story a hundred times. So that was Grianne Holmesford. I had to take nine books to figure out what was gonna to happen to her. But uh, basically that was the, make, the nature of that story. And it, you know, it just kind of goes on from there. So those kinds of ideas always spur me. And sometimes it's, 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 it's certainly characters, certain characters impact what you do because you get really caught up in their story when you start to write it. But mostly I think you have to sit down with that sense of this is the story, the heart of the story. This is, I don't know where I want it to go, but this is the heart of the story. And then you start, it, it, the story, if you're writing the story the way it's meant to be written, for me at least, it's always a case of if you write the first chapter, it will tell you what the next chapter needs to be, which will tell you what the third chapter needs to be. There's a pattern there to doing this often enough that you can see exactly where the story needs to go. And all you need to do is keep straight what it is that you're trying to do with the whole story so you don't go from the desert to the ocean all of a sudden and wonder why you're drowning. You have to follow that sense of where it needs to go. Yeah. Question? Matt, uh, yes. Uh, great. Can you please go back to the first principle that you said about the story in the world and give an example? I, I got a little lost, uh, that the story has to be something that relates to the world. Oh, just just that what, what I see in this world is what I write about. So at any given time, depending on the story, uh, I have so many examples. It, it, whenever, I, whenever I see something happening out there that bothers me, that's my favorite thing. I read a newspaper again for the 80th time. It's the same story. But it's different because it's about different people or the story is slightly different in the way that it comes about. So I read the story and I get all upset. And it's easy for me to do that because that's who I am. So I get upset and then I think, well, you know, how, how, what do I want to write about this story? What would, I, what would I do with it? And so I start asking questions and questions lead to more questions and so forth until something comes up there where you kind of have a kernel of something that's really important. So in the Grand Olmsford story, the question was, uh, for that story, it was pretty simple. Suppose you had committed the worst possible crimes. You killed people deliberately, you know, relentlessly over a period of time. How do you ever come back from that, really? How do you come back from that? Well, you know, you, be, you do good things, right? And if you do good things, then you are forgiven. Under all religions, you're forgiven for what you've done. Well, maybe not all of them, but most of them, you can be forgiven. However, the truth of the matter is that doesn't necessarily work because we don't simply forgive people who have done really bad things. You know, I thought for a long time my perfect example was all strange religions that had uh, the tent, the tent type of religions where there were all of these conversions made and people could come in and confess and then they would be forgiven and everything would go back to being, you know, the biblical approach of how you have it wiped away your sins so now you're all right. But in real life, it doesn't work like that. That's just a fiction. And how it works is entirely different. And for somebody to really be forgiven and to really get, you have to do a lot of different things to really get yourself back to where you're going to be. I wanted to write something about that, so that took me off in another direction. Does that help? No. 
Yes, I see. I see nothing. Um, so you talked a lot about how kind of big picture issues will inspire you, especially if it's something that makes you angry. Do you also ever take like smaller details from real life and the world and twist them and incorporate them, incorporate them in your world building? And can you give us some examples of that? Any advice to like a, a young writer who's trying to figure out how to make a, a unique world? And well, I think that your characters help you uh, develop the stories that you want to tell because when you're building a character, see how can I put this in simple terms? Uh, if you're if you're building a series of characters in a story, the question is how do you build the character's life? And for me, the first question you always ask yourself is what is their problem? You know, what is the weakness that they have that they have to overcome? Because we all spend a whole lot of time trying to make ourselves better, right? So the way we do that is we overcome the, the weaknesses or the failures in our life in some way that we can find a way to do it. And this is, these are what stories are all about and what people are interested in, right? That's why they read all those uh, magazines about uh, the lives of actors and actresses who turn out to be something different than what we think they are. So without the actors and actress parts, you look at this, the situation with each of these characters and you find a way to develop a story so that you're moving them in some particular kind of direction. You have to reveal what the problem is they're dealing with. You have to show if they can overcome it or not overcome it. And that makes the, puts the heart in the story for most people. And yeah, there's a lot of smaller issues there. But you have to work to figure out how you want to fit those in. And sometimes it happens easily, and sometimes it's not so easy. Now, <clears throat> that was going to be my follow-up question. But have there been any characters that have been particularly uh, challenging for you to kind of figure out what that core problem for them is um, and how if you explore, how do you explore a character and really dive into that? Presuming that I'm not, you know, pushing 80 and that I still have any kind of a memory <laughs> and that I can look back over however many years it's been, 50 years of writing these books, all of which is not true. <laughs> you know, uh, it's very hard to, to come up with specifics at this point about what I was doing when I was doing it. I can think about somebody like Garrett Jacks, for example. That's a good example of, of a character that was easy to easy to create, but difficult to define and difficult to determine what should happen to. And he was like so many characters in all kinds of stories, who was so good at what he did that nobody was better. So what was left for him in life? His, his only possible passion at that point was to continue to develop his talent against people who were better than he was or who might have been better than he was and then put himself up against the test and see if he could survive it <coughs> without going further. Um. So the question that you've probably probably been asked a million times, and I think every published author gets from younger writers, is to outline or not to outline. <laughs> Where do you stand on that? <laughs> well, that's a very hard question. Uh, uh, I started outlining uh, early uh, because uh, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I had to learn it through outlining my books to the extent that it helped map out where the story was going and, and to eliminate some of the problems early on that I would have run into otherwise. Um, and then I wrote a second book. <laughs> and my second book, my editor said, what happened here? This book is terrible. Um, and I said, <laughs> you must be mistaken. I just sold um team million books. What do you mean this book is terrible? Uh, and I threw a snit and I went into a dark decline for a while. That was Lester Del Rey, who was, did not miss words or waste any time with telling you how wonderful you were, because you already knew what you were, and that was enough for him. Just forget it. But I, I, I did, I, I did, and, and I and I heard from his wife, Judy Lynn, who, who was the lead person in the Del Rey book line at that time, and she called me up after he wrote uh, and told me that he was going to reject this book, and she said, uh, "How you doing, Brooks?" She always called me, and I said, well, I'm not very happy about this, and Lester's wrong. And she said, here's a piece of advice for you. Lester is always right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 
put it aside, and he sent the manuscript back with notes completely through that book, telling me what was wrong. And he, and I read it through, and damn, he was right. He pointed out all the things that were wrong, and every time he did, he was right on track. So I wrote a new book, and it was Elfstones. Hmm. And Elfstones was one of the better books I've ever written, I think. And um, it was all due to Lester saying, this book's no good, write a better book. And you need, everybody needs that in this business. Every so often, somebody needs to call you to count. <coughs> um, and for a while there, I was coasting along with it. But uh, in the 2000s and after, I got called on the carpet more than a few times to say, think about what you're doing. Think about the way you approached it. Do this, do that. And, and then take another look at it. And I just had that done to me again, by the way. Uh, and it doesn't get any easier, but at least you get smarter about how to approach it after a while. This is kind of a selfish question, but kind of building off that. Do you feel like at any point in your career, um, you were big enough that an editor was scared to call you out on something? Or like, how has that changed where uh, now somebody did? I don't know. Yeah, well, nobody's scared of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only 5'6", and I, <laughs> I have no skills. Uh, so you know, uh, I, I never thought of myself in those terms. Um, and my relationships with my editors have always been very strong, and I've always relied heavily on the editors I've had. I've had four editors, and they've all been very good. Um, <laughs> the last editor, my current editor, is Ann Grohl. Ann Grohl came over from the uh, from Bantam as part of a merger, and uh, my other editor retired. So I, I think, at any rate, she was gone. So I went in talk to Ann Grohl for the first time, and uh, I knew who she was because she edited George Martin. So I knew she had some chops. So I said, look, the only thing I really want to tell you is I don't want you to mess around. If you think I'm doing something wrong, if you see mistakes in my work, uh, I want you to call me that right now. And she looked at me and she said, that's good. Because for one thing, George only turns a book in once in a millennia. And for another thing, she said, I'm always going to tell you when you're wrong. <laughs> and she does. And I, it helps. It helps tremendously if you can put your ego aside long enough to look carefully at what's being asked. You can usually find a way to deal with it. But that, that you know, and it's one of the problems I see with a lot of writers I read. And it's probably true for you. Just what's worse in the world than reading 10 books by, that are really great and then having the person write a book that is not so good? You want to say, hey, what happened to this book? So I try to avoid that particular call to the carpet. Yeah, I, I think for a new writer, it's very hard to get that criticism, right? And you just kind of want to shut down and be like, no, you just don't. You don't understand. And I think with my first practice novel where I was imitating you, that was kind of my my response. It was like, no, they don't get it. Um, and but you know, there's that core inside of me that was like, no, they, they, something here isn't working. I think they're right. Well, you, yeah, none of us want to hear that we're not doing good work. Yeah. You know, or that this isn't living living up to expectations or whatever. Nobody wants to hear that. But the fact of the matter is, is you cannot be perfect all the time no matter how hard you try, because that's not who you are, whoever you are. Uh, you have to be aware of the fact that sometimes you need to be called on the carpet about something, and you have to be told, this can be better. Make it better. Here's something I can give you to help you make it better, and that's what an editor does for you. They've done it for me so many times. I owe so much to those two men and two women <laughs> that I don't even know where to start. And uh, that's why every, every one of them has a book dedicated thank them for the help that they gave me. I think that's part of what we all look for. Absolutely. Um, I like Some of my happiest moments as a writer is getting critical feedback from an editor and then it being like, I know how to fix that. And just being, oh my gosh, to make the book so much better. So it's like that ugh feeling followed by like success. It's, it's always that sensation that, how come you knew this and I didn't? Yeah. You know, but they do. They know stuff. I saw a hand in the back. Yes? Um, sorry, just trip back a little to the world building question. Um, you talk about um, sort of the world building based on sort of the current as premise, but I wonder about the connection of um, world building and sort of the development of your plot. And particularly, like, 
give a tip for how do you give yourself permission to keep writing if you have finished building out the world, like getting distracted into building out some rule set or researching a name or just silly things? How do you kind of balance that? I, I, that's a really good question, and it's very important. Um, I get by by pretending I know a lot that I don't. Uh, it works great, you know. This is why I was a lawyer, it was to learn how to do this. And I learned it. It's really very helpful in life. Pretend you know stuff and then you don't. Or become a politician. Huh? Any of those things work. Um, but I think what you have to do really is you have to, you have to realize that uh, world building does not mean putting everything down in a big lump. You know, world building is to be done piecemeal, a little at a time. Reveal this when it's necessary. Don't reveal something until you need to reveal it. Then reveal it. Up to that point, you need to, you don't need to do it. So give yourself the space to put these things in at intervals where they seem to fit best. Now that's something you learn by doing as much as anything else. It's, it's easy for me to sit up here and say that's how you do it. But you have to write a few books before you get a sense of how that works for you because everybody's different in this business. That's why it's always hard to talk about how do I become successful as a writer? I don't know. I don't know how I'm successful as a writer. I just found a way to do it that works. And it's mostly a case of you have to work at it till you get it right. And as, as Ray Bradbury said, you know, if you want to be a good writer, write a million words and then you've started. You know, throw it all away and then start again. Then you'll be all right. Uh, there's that sense that you have to get into the way of doing it. I mean, I've written 40 books, 42 books, two of which aren't published yet. I'm working on the 43rd right now. How much do I know? I know as much as I know for having gone this far. Do I still learn all the time? Absolutely, every single time. And sometimes I relearn for crying out loud. It's just in the nature of what you do because it's complex. The thing I would add to that as someone who's not written quite as many books <laughs> is that a lot of my world building comes through revision. Like a first draft often will have the big info dump and I'll just put it in there so it's out of my head and on the page and I know that I have to move it later. Or as I get further into a story and I understand some more details on revision, I can go back and add it in. So if you're really... That, it, that is, that is, listen to her. <laughs> that is an excellent piece of advice. And uh, there are all kinds of ways that you can revise. Uh, so you don't need to lock yourself into saying, well, I'm going to write the first draft, then I'm going to write the second draft, and so forth. One of the most famous writers I know out there once told me in a panel uh, where I said, are you nuts? Uh, after she was done, she said, I go through and I write the story just to get the words down. Then I go back and I work on the plot and write it again. Then I go back and work on the characters and write it again. By this point, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how she worked. And because she's as good as she is, obviously for her, that works fine. What works for me, though, specifically, is that um, I will write a chapter in piecemeal. I'll do three, four pages, and then I'll go back and I'll reread those three, four pages and revise them. And then I'll continue on with the rest of that chapter, because they run, on average, for my chapters run 12 to 15 pages, something like that. Then I'll finish that chapter, and then I'll reread the whole thing, and then I think it's perfect. I'll put it aside. Start the next one the same way. Then when I'm done, I'll give the whole thing a once-over and see how it's holding together, and if there are major plots problems that need to be dealt with or anything else you have to do right then. And then it gets read three or four more times by other people with other minds and other approaches to what's going on. But it's the sense of you polish it over and over because that's the way you do it. Obviously you have to learn to love to do this, but you know, uh, you can love to learn you can learn to love your own writing. It's not that difficult. Just keep telling yourself this is really good. No. <laughs> uh, but there is a there is a polishing aspect to it that's very very important because you catch so much the second and third time you read the book, and you get a, a much better result by doing this. And I would never tell anybody not not to revise and just do it. Although I know some writers who claim they just write it straight through. 
fact, my, ed my editor, Lester, used to say he wrote straight through. And they said he would sit down and write the book in 36 hours and be done. Wow. I hated him. <laughs> I feel like that is advice that a lot of authors give, though. They say, don't go back and revise as you go. Write yeah, the whole thing. Lot, don't do it. And don't like it. I, that's unfathomable to me. I revise like you so much as I go. And I liken it to kind of like combing out the knots of the story and then going a little bit further. Um, I'm not I'm, uh, quite as methodical as you are. Like, I'm still figuring things out a little bit. I but, don't know. So don't listen, don't listen to people when they say you can't revise as you go. I think that maybe the purpose of that is they don't want you to get stuck thinking everything has to be perfect before you move on to the next chapter, because uh, that's definitely not the case. I think, yeah, I don't know. There are tricks to making this work as they say, and uh, it certainly helps to think ahead all the time about where your story's going. And it certainly helps to always consider if a revision in the characters <coughs> needs to happen at any given point, so you can get on early instead of having to go back and do it all the way through, that sort of thing. But it's just, a, it's, it basically is your writer's sense telling you when something isn't working, and when it needs to be changed, and then you go do something about it. Uh, and that's, you know, trial by error and familiarity. Uh, yes. Yeah, I understand that you know you reveal the world that you built in piecemeal as the, as it, as needed. But I was wondering, in, in your process, do you um, do advanced work on what is what what is this world? What are the rules of it? How does the magic work? How do you know? Do you do that in advance, and then like you say, you did an info dump of your world. You must have thought about it in advance, or do do, do you change it as it goes along? I have a secret. My secret is that I cheat, and you know how I do it? I write in sequence. You may have noticed. My stories follow one after the other. So, how much do I have to do in the first book? Just enough to get through the first book. And then when I go to the second book, I can change things around. Or if, if I write in groups of books, I can do it in groups. And I can change it around. And I can take it this way, and I can take it that way, and I expand the territory. So a lot of the work that I do from one book to the next in the genre books is built on each book as we go. And that saves me a lot of hassle with having to start over. It's a lot harder to start everything over with every book, isn't it? Because you've got to reinvent everything every time over. And I'm way too lazy for that, so <laughs> I thought. But you know, I've written some. I've written well. Word and uh, Word and Boy is only three books, and it was a cyclical storyline that starts in one place and comes right around to the end of that place. And it's all um, about one person's life uh, over a period of three. Three decades, I guess it is, uh, uh, where we're following her story and what she's involved in too. So uh, there, you're 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 kind of forced to think a little harder about what what you're going to do and where you're going to go. But I think that's pretty much the answer: is uh, you have to put as much work into it as it requires, and that has to do with the kind of story you're writing. What do you think people write murder mysteries for God's sake? All you got to figure out is the murder. Then you got all your characters, they're already established, and you can take it down the road that it's gonna go. The, that's why the writers that really impress me are the ones whose characters are always developing from one book to the next. And the really good writers, the ones that have have extreme talent. Janine, who's your favorite writer? Uh, hmm. You know, in, in Mysteries. A Canadian. Uh, Louise Penny. Louise Penny. Louise Penny is she can't say she's a master at it, but she's she's a mistress of it, and she is really good at doing that. And there are others too that know how to take the, the, that storyline and each time develop the character further, because that's what we want to see. Is we want to see the characters grow. If you've ever read Ed McBain, Eighty Seven Precinct Mysteries? Those were like quick throwaway books, but in every story, the detectives on the Eighty Seven Precinct Squad changed. Things happened in their lives. They got divorced, they got married, they had children, they had this, that, and the other thing. Pretty smart. So every time you read it, you were reading it, not only for the story of the mystery, but also to find out how these lives of these detectives were changing. That's the sort of thing that draws readers in. They want to see about the characters and how they're going to be altered. Uh, I would 
add, um, one thing I do a lot of is jot what if notes and questions to myself and just it's a thought experiment of um, trying to, like for my second book has a strong social media thread and I wanted to create a social media company that was not quite as evil as Facebook but still had problems. So it was a lot of like, okay, so there's a school shooting and this kid tries to stream it how is it possible for them to shut that down? It's kind of like this thought experiment of, so just a lot of notes of what kind of problems could come up in this world, what kind of answers do I need to have, and possible answers, and yeah, I just do a lot of that work off the page, and sometimes on the page, and I have to edit it as I go. Of what you know about your world and about your character. Oh, yeah. Never reaches the page. I like coaching. You know. <laughs> you talk about That's true. Uh, your lines, you know oh, this is, but you don't need to write it all down. This is Elizabeth George again uh, that I was just talking about. Elizabeth George says this all the time. She gets up and she says, and they say, and she writes, you know, a thousand page books. And <laughs> People say, how do you come up with all this? She says, I only write about 20% to 25% of what I know about my characters. He said, people don't need to know all the story, things that are uh, pertinent to that character. They just need to know enough to be able to picture that character and to see the development and, and what happens in their lives. And they don't have to make it a religion. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's pretty smart. Uh, the fact that she knows in her own head and can answer the questions if you ask her about a particular characters, you know, whatever, uh, there could be a response there. But it doesn't all need to go in the book. What needs to go in the book, and this is, gets back to the world building thing, is that what needs to go in the book is what re the book requires be there for the purpose of completing the story and making you feel like you're a part of the story. You know, it, we don't need to know the character suffers from, hic from hiccups, for example, unless that's some kind of a crucial element to the story. We don't need to know the things that happen, uh, that may happen off stage, it may happen in this character, but you need to have the sense that if you ask the author the question, they would have the answer to give to you. So it's cre creating the world has to have that sense of completion. Uh, a question about saying Organize when you've went, when you've written forty plus books. This can't all just be in your head, right? Do you have a system for keeping track of the various the lore of the different realms you've written about and character traits and everything? Just how do you, how do you keep track of it all? Yeah, I I was uh, pretty good for about twenty years uh, at keeping track of things. I outlined in those days and uh, before I quit outlining, um, and so I I had. A, pretty good ability to go back, but at, at the end of that time period, uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to stumble over the age of social media. And um, as a result, uh, my current web druid, Sean Speakman, well, my only web druid ever, <laughs> Sean Speakman, uh, applied for the job of being my permanent website. He run the permanent website, the official website, and so forth. And my uh, and he submitted a resume to the publishing house. And the publishing house said, you better read this because he's pretty good. And I said, well, I don't know. And they said, well, it looks where you are, so that should help. <laughs> so I looked at it, and sure enough, and, and Sean was great. So Sean is younger by quite a bit than I am. Well, not quite a bit, but quite. Yeah, but True, <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> and, and, uh, so he's got, he's got First of all, he's got a strong, he's read all the books, he's a big fan, started out as a big fan, and he knows the ant storylines really well. And he also is able to, through the magic of, of, of his record keeping, get the answers immediately to everything. So I quit thinking about it. Now, <laughs> you know, if I have a question now, I just say, well, Sean, you know, what, what's the answer to this? And he will say, I'll get back to you, and he will get back to me and give me the answer. Uh, that I need, and I don't have to, you know, think through 40 books or whatever to figure out what the answer is on about anything. So that helps tremendously. Um, also, if you have readers who are loyal, and I do, uh, they will write you and tell you 
<laughs> if you seem to be stumbling as you go, or if they see something here that doesn't, uh, or if you make any mistake at all. You know, I learned early on. Here's one of the more important lessons I earned, learned early on. My books have been read from by people who, kids, eight years and up. They read these books. I never thought that was true. Why would an eight-year-old read my book? Well, they do. And uh, they tell you. And they come in and they say, you know, I, I, I can read, read your books. And I say, that's so nice. And I mean, which one have you read? All of them. <coughs> I said, well, all of them? I said, you really know? And I'll question them about it. And they know everything. And they will tell you in a nanosecond where you messed up. <laughs> <laughs> they will. They're not, you know, bashful about this. They will tell you and they will call you on the carpet on it, which is a very humbling but important thing for them to do. Uh, so I'm always grateful for that kind of, of criticism and response from readers. It shows they're really interested. I've probably read Elf Queen 20 times when I was a kid. Like there were details that are still seared into my memory, but I definitely would not have had the gall to tell you if I caught a mistake when I, when I was a kid. <laughs> well, it takes a certain amount of moxie, but you know, <laughs> those kids have it. Um, uh, a very specific question. Um, so your most recent book, Child of Light, is in a completely different world. Um, and I would love to hear a little bit about how, what kind of thought went into creating specifically a magic system for this world that was distinct from the, the Shannara books. Um, and if there were any any points where you're like, no, I can't do it this way, I want it to be different, or yeah, just the thought into creating a completely different world than the one you'd been working in beforehand. Well, after I finished uh, with a, not a bang, but a whimper, uh, the end of the Shannara <coughs> series because of COVID and all the parties and all the uh, celebrations and all that went dead in the water and they basically just canceled everything out right there and it, that was the last book well that's it it's over get a get a hold of yourself mm -hmm. so I thought huh and I wrote another book uh, that isn't published yet and um, I struggled with it quite a bit and it didn't it was I don't even want to tell you what it's about because I'm going I'm not sure what I want to do but in any case I finished it and then I sat down and I said where am I gonna go with this thing next and I thought, you know, I want to write a book where everything important starts right away, right now, in the first chapter. You know, I want people, when they read this book, to not be able to put the book down after they read that first sentence. And then I wanted to whiz bang through as hard as I can right in the end. So I said, well, what would do that? I said, well, you know, uh, somebody's in prison. They're breaking out, and they can't get away, but they're going to try as hard as they can. And then everybody dies, except the one person. I thought that would get them. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it really worked well, because it really got me, because I got so involved in that book, I wrote it four months. So Child of Light was one of those books where I knew where I was going. I didn't have to think about it. The only question, and the other element of that book, uh, for those of you who have read it, and I'm sure you all have, haven't you, uh, yes. is that, um, is the problems that exist within the family. Because one of the characters in the family is a very harsh, harsh person for reasons that make sense as you go along. But the point is, is that there are a lot of lies, there are a lot of misconceptions, there are a lot of deceptions, there are a lot of pretenses that go on in the story and you don't know about them until you come across them and somebody reveals the truth. And I like that aspect of the story too because I wanted, uh, I wanted Oris, who's the main character, to not have any idea who she really was. And she, the whole story is about her discovering that she is nothing what she thinks she is or thought she was. She's not even human. You know? And so that, that's pretty good. And I thought, well, I've got something here that will work. So that's what got me into it. And I'm, the sequel to that book comes out in October um, called Daughter of Darkness. And the third book comes out next year. So, you know, yeah, it's just, again, this ma the schematic for magic was pretty simple. I wanted Horus to have magic but not know it. I wanted there to be two worlds, a world of humans and a world of fae. And the two 
did not basically know the, the, the they knew that humans existed, but they were kept up, they kept themselves apart. The humans, some of them knew that there were there was a fake community. Most of them didn't. They just went on their lives pretty much like we do. Uh, favorite subject of mine is very much what I did in uh, Running with the Demon. Is some of the people knew about the creatures that were you know under the ground, but most most of us didn't. We were just going about our business. We don't we don't pay attention to that sort of stuff. Um, so that was those elements going into it at that point. The story really wrote itself, I have to say, and uh, I was in, engaged in it so heavily. And then you know you turn a book in like that and. Um, you don't know what the response is going to be, but the response was... It's, it's funny because uh, when I wrote the Shannon's books, the critics by and large said, eh, you know, follow the roll. Uh, and uh, very seldom did I get a review that really said, we loved this story, this was a good book. It happened once or twice, but not a lot. So I write this book, and I got a million great reviews. Everybody loves this book. I sold about a third of what I would have sold in the other. So you just never know. Pick your poison. Um, slightly different topic. Uh, are there any mistakes that you often see beginner writers make just over and over? Anything you would warn against, uh, particularly in work, world building, but anything else as well? Don't overuse words. Don't, you know. Every, every sentence does not need an adjective. Um, be spare when you can. Usually less is more, uh, and less is better for that matter. I see an awful lot of books that are way overwritten and don't need to be. Uh, some writers can do this because they're so good, but, like, but you know, they are few and far between. And for the most part, most of us are just working like writers, and uh, it's best if we keep our language pared down as much as we possibly can. I didn't do that in the old days. The first three books, I was all over the place. Uh, and I admit it. I, I go back on those books, and I have a little shudder now and then as I read what, the way I wrote things. But that's how you get to where you are. So you just have to do that. Um, so that's, that's the one thing I, I, I see as a problem. Um, I was also taught, uh, if you're trying to write the big story and the great idea, just forget it. You know. If you think you're writing something original and wonderful and so forth, somebody else has already done it. So don't get carried away with that. Just tell a good story. Make your story good. Your voice is your voice. Nobody else has your voice. So however you tell the story, it's going to be different. Don't get all caught up in the idea that this story has been done before. Because, you know, after all, that's what we're looking for, isn't it? Why else do people read the same kind of book over and over again? You know, it's because we loved that story before, we want to see another one. That's it, that's what counts for everything I've done, for gosh sakes. So um, I think you, you would be, I would caution people about that, those things, and, and don't be too hard on yourself. I could have used that advice about over, overwriting with my second pra practice novel. I remember going to a <laughs> conference, and there was a literary agent on the panel who said, Every good book, the first sentence somehow encapsulates the entire novel. <clears throat> I remember hearing that and being like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> next, it goes without saying, my next round of revisions, my first sentence was about a page long. <laughs> you know, just trying to make it as elaborate as possible. And obviously, it, it, it did not work. And I think oh. there was a strong urge to do that. What's the best story ever written? How does it start? Call me Ishmael. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> um, are there are any of your characters ever inspired by the real people, whether it's a historical figure um, or somebody in your life? Well, God forbid. No, I don't <laughs> write anything about anyone in my life. I don't. Uh, I may pick up aspects of people's characters uh, that mirror those of people in my life, but I, I, I never rely on, <laughs> good thing for Sean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> rely close to, probably Janine too. Who murdered me in a book? <laughs> <laughs> I did kill him off once or twice. Uh, no, I, I really don't. I, I think that the, the, the 
what you need to do is you need to treat your characters. This is what I forgot to tell you this. I, the, the way you treat my characters is we have a calling, calling of, of actors. And they have to come on stage. And each of the, them comes on stage. And we look at them. And we see what they like and how they behave and how we view them and so forth. And if they seem like they're, they've got potential, then you know, we, we give them a call back. It, otherwise, it's you know, back, to, uh, back to central casting, and maybe later on we can find a use for them. But I think you have to treat it as a, as a, as a, very much as a, uh, an acting, uh, acting experience where the people who come on have to prove themselves before they can actually be in the book. And that's how I decide. But there are never any people that I actually know, just as well. Yes. Hi, I was just wondering, obviously, prolific writing with Shannara, how did you decide that you were ready to move on? Did you have an original story arc? That, I mean, obviously, it's a huge time frame involved here. Did you have an original story arc and you said, okay, I'm done telling the story? Or did you just kind of wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm ready to do something new? Yes, sir. <laughs> I wish I could sit here and tell you I knew where I was going even three books ahead. Mm -hmm. Never, never did I know that. I didn't have any idea if anyone even buy the first book, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have any idea if I could finish it. It took me six years. Uh, so I was writing up one book at a time, and then I would finish the first book, and I would start to think about the second book, because that's what they say, how are you coming with the next book? So you think, well, okay, I don't know. It's pretty good, pretty good, it's coming along. Um, and then you go home and think about what it ought to be. Uh, but I never had a strong sense of particular story arc. I mean, I knew the kind of story I wanted to tell. I knew from the beginning what the arc was in terms of where this story in the long run was going to go. How was the world going to change over that period of 3,000 years? And, and what was it I was trying to say uh, uh, about things and, and as, I, as I wrote the story? That was always there. And I was always writing towards that end. But in between, I wasn't even thinking about it in, in concrete terms. I was thinking about how does this story relate to the last story and how will it relate to the next story. So you take it kind of one step at a time, like you, you, you go through, a, through one of those puzzle gardens or something like that, and determining where you're going with the story. Um, I wish I were more brilliant, but I am not. <laughs> and for me, it's, it's always been a kind of find, find your way the best way you can, develop your characters the best way you can. Um, and, you know, I mean, people seem to like that, so I didn't go away from it. I just stuck to it. Thank you. Sure. Um, I would love to talk a little bit about what it's like to build a world and then, you know, release it. Um, I don't know if you guys can tell, but I'm hesitating a little bit every time I say Shannara, because in my head it has always been Shinhara. <laughs> and then I was on a panel at Phoenix Comic Con with my debut novel talking about. <clears throat> some of my earliest influences and I mentioned Terry's uh, books and a couple came up to me afterwards and was like how dare you it is genre <laughs> you cannot desecrate this series by pronouncing it the, the wrong way and I was like I didn't know I was just I've never actually heard it spoken by somebody who knew um, so I imagine that that happens a lot and what is it like to have someone interpret things a little bit differently than you intended, pronounce things differently than you intended? Um, was it hard? Have you gotten used to it? Uh, do you cringe when you hear Shannara? Uh, I'm just grateful that people read the books. <laughs> <laughs> you may notice that the, there's no appendixes in my books, uh, no pronunciation guides, uh, no genealogy charts to speak of. Um, and that's because uh, that was one of the things that I wanted to move away from that Tolkien did. Um, I thought, um, much as I love these books, uh, a lot of this feels like it's uh, additional stuff that doesn't need to be here. Uh, get rid of Tom Bombadil. Uh, let's, let's move this story along. Because number one, I wasn't an English Don, you know, with capabilities that, uh, that he possessed. I was just, you know, a workmanlike writer. And that's the way I thought I should write and not get carried away with trying to do something beyond what I was capable of doing. So I never worried about it. And however people pronounced the stories, I thought, that's fine. It's their story. Once, once, you, once you write a book and you've finished it, you've turned it in, 
it doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs to the readers. It's the readers now. How they view it, how they treat it, that's what makes all the difference in the world. And so that's the thing that interests me. So if people suddenly pronounce a name differently, I'm not going to go out and say, well, you're not saying it right. I mean, what the heck? Forget that. That's not important. It's only important that I create the story that appeals to them and that they find a way to do it. And this is a true story. When I did the, the television show, whatever it was called, Chronicles of Shannara, first thing I went, I met with the writers uh, uh, after they started doing the work on it. So they came in and they, they said, uh, they came in and they said, well, we're going to start casting uh, for Shannara. And they went through a couple of lines and they used the word Shannara a couple of times. And I said, you know, you're not pronouncing it the right way. And they said, we aren't? And I said, no, you're not. It's Shannara. And they said, not as far as your readers are concerned. <laughs> We're going to go with them. And psh, that was the end of that discussion. <laughs> Were, were you tempted in the next book to have somebody stop mid sword fight and like be like, no, no, no? <laughs> so, uh, again, slightly different topic. So, you've also written two movie adaptations. Um, and I would just love to hear a little bit about that experience and was it constructive? Restricting, like confining to work in somebody else's world, or was it like playing with new toys? Uh, well, I I'm going to try and keep this brief because there's so much I could say, and much of it you don't want to hear. Uh, the first one I did was uh, the, the Robert Williams cast, uh, what's his name? Peter Pan. Uh, I lobbied for that job. God help me. <laughs> and uh, I got it. And uh, what I discovered was is that in a Steven Spielberg film, you never get to meet Steven Spielberg. In fact, you never get to meet anybody except, you know, minion number one and two. And they tell you why it is that you cannot see or look at anything. And that everything you do has to be signed under secrecy. They call for crying out loud, you know, what am I going to do? Run out there and sell it to the, I don't know, I don't even know who they want. Anyhow, uh, so I, I spent that movie in such a snit, even though I was happy with the way the, the, the uh, script turned out and all of that, I, I was happy with the story. I liked the way the story went, and I felt like I captured the parts of it that I needed to capture. But I was not happy with the way it worked, and so I went out of there and I said, I'm never going to do this again. This is the end of this. I'm never writing another. Don't ask me. Don't tempt me. Don't do anything. So for five years, they ignored me, and then they called up and they said, you know, Steven Spielberg wants you to write. Not Steven Spielberg. The other guy. George Lucas. George Lucas wants you to write. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you. The first genre. The first. Uh, oh, the Phantom Menace, yeah, right? Phantom Menace. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it. And I was talking with the president of Ballantyne, so that was a fairly bold thing to say. And she said, you might want to think about that and maybe go talk to your family. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, what, what does that mean? And then I got to thinking about it, and I thought, well, all of my children are rabid fans. If they learn I've turned this down, I will be moved out of the house. <laughs> so I went back and said, OK. And that was a completely enjoyable experience. I got to go to Skywalker Ranch and spend a few days. I got to see all of the sets. I got to see, watch. Uh, excerpts from the movie, we got to spend time with George Lucas talking about the thing, and I, I discovered that uh, I like him a lot. Um, I have to tell you, for one thing, we look a lot alike. Uh, for another, <laughs> except he has a uh, for, for another, uh, we come from the same background, where we grew up with comic books, and we grew up with storytelling, and adventure stories, and all this sort of stuff. And I asked him, what, what are you doing with me, with this story? You know, I don't do science fiction. And he says, no, good, I don't either. And I said, ah, you don't, huh? He says, no. He says, I don't care that you don't do that. I just want you to do the story the way you write. I said, okay, fine. 
And so we kind of went from there. It was like, you know, test this and that and the other thing. So that was really good, and I enjoyed it. But I think, you know, once you've done it twice, you've probably done it. Uh, so we're coming up on uh, the end of our time here. I have a couple of wrap-up questions that I like to ask every guest. Uh, one is, can you give some examples of either some really good writing advice you've received or some really bad writing advice that you've received over the years? I blotted out all the bad writing <laughs> advice. <laughs> uh, the good writing advice is easy. You know. Again, a lot of it I got from early on from Lester Dilray. He, he was a master at putting a story together. And that whole thing about writing a story in 36 hours is a true story, I discovered later. Uh, but he said to me uh, on a, on a couple things. One, he said, he said don't, don't try to reinvent the world. He said, write what you know, stick to what you know, Write the story the way you would tell it to somebody if you were reading them for the first time. Do it that way, and you'll save yourself a whole lot of trouble. And that was that was that was probably the single most important piece of advice I ever got. Um, and, and I still, to this day, kind of stick to that story, that storytelling form. I, I believe that you're better off not trying to overdo uh, what you might think you can do, but to stay true to what's gotten you to where you are. And uh, finally, are there any books that you've read recently that you just loved and, and would recommend? Yeah, about 500. How many <laughs> time we got here? Um, well, let's see. What would I what, what would I talk about? I would I would certainly talk about uh, the House by the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune. Amazing, mm -hmm. amazing book. I loved it so much. I got hold of him by Zoom. And I told him how much I loved that book. And he was sort of like, whoa, you did? Yeah. I said, no, it was a terrific book. It's probably the best Zoom call of his life. It was, it was, that book made me cry. It really did. It makes me cry just thinking back on what he did with that. Um, I enjoyed that. Um, I, I, don't, I don't, it's really hard to say. Uh, I always have trouble when I'm trying to think about the books that I've, I've read and uh, try to remember what they were because for some reason, I, I don't seem able to do that very well. I read a lot of, uh, of uh, literary fiction, believe it or not. I know it doesn't show, but I do. Um, so I read uh, M.R. Bowles. I think he's a terrific writer. Uh, Lauren Groff is terrific. Um, the guy who wrote, you know, see, I can't remember any of these things. My mind goes blank. Who's the guy in from New York that we like so much? Oh man, so many. Oh, Peter B. Brett. No, not Peter. <laughs> not Peter, no. <laughs> the one who wrote the, the Magicians. Oh, Love Grossman. Love Grossman. Yeah. Terrific writer. Uh, well, that's what jumps to mind right off the bat, but I know there's a whole bunch more I'm not talking about. Um, I liked uh, Emily St. John. I'm looking Glass Motel, Hotel back there. I don't know. I just read. I think one of the things that I encourage, maybe this is something important, is don't, if you're writing fantasy, read something else. <laughs> read something else. Because really, you'll never grow as a writer if you only read the same thing you write. You need to read outside your field and you need to read things that appeal to you as a person uh, as well as what appeals to you as a writer. And so I spend at least half of my time reading books that have nothing to do with, uh, with what I write. Just because probably most of my ideas that are, are good, are really good, come from reading other writers that don't work in my field at all. And it opens up the, uh, avenues that I might have not opened up for myself. Okay. Uh, I think that's a great note to finish things off on. Um, one quick housekeeping thing before we uh, open up for signing, and it's just uh, our next WordCraft event will be September 22nd. We'll have uh, Sherry Priest here talking mm -hmm. about pacing and plot, and I hope I'll see some of you then. And the uh, most important thing is, Terry, thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed this discussion. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.